Neptune is known as the eighth most distant planet from the Sun. It is 30 times farther from the Sun than the Earth, making it too distant to be seen by the naked eye. On September 23, 1846, Neptune was the first planet to be discovered through mathematical calculations. It was the second planet after Uranus to be revealed with a telescope but the first planet discovered by astronomers who were specifically looking for it. Because of its blue color, Neptune was named after the god of the sea in Roman mythology. The story of the discovery of this mysterious blue giant on the outskirts of the solar system is quite curious and unusual. It was a triumph for Newtonian physics, because it proved that the motion of planets is entirely subject to the laws of gravity. Neptune has a composition close to Uranus, and both planets are placed in a distinct category of ice giants. Neptune has a bright blue color with a particular azure tint. Externally, it looks very similar to Uranus. These two planets can even be confused. However, the color of Neptune is more saturated and bright. Neptune is the smallest of the gas giants. Also called the planet of storms, Neptune is the seat of the strongest winds in the solar system. Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we are going to explore the outer reaches of the solar system in search of the secrets of the distant planet Neptune. But before leaving for a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. Thank you, and have a nice trip. Neptune is the eighth most distant planet in the solar system. It is also the fourth largest planet in diameter and the third largest in mass. In fact, Neptune's mass is 17 times greater than Earth's, while its diameter is only four times greater than our planet. Despite its title as the fourth largest planet in the solar system, we could easily fit 58 Earths inside Neptune. Thus, the average density of Neptune is only 1.6 grams per cubic centimeter. That is to say, about one-third of that of the Earth, or about one and a half times more than that of water. The low densities are characteristic of the four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Among these four, the first two are the least dense because they are mainly made of gas. The densest are Uranus and Neptune, because they are mainly made of ice. With Uranus, Neptune belongs to a subclass of gas giants, called ice giants, because of their smaller size and their composition, made mainly of volatile elements, such as methane, ammonia and water, rather than hydrogen and helium. The average distance between Neptune and the Sun is 4.5 billion kilometers, or 3.7 billion miles, which is about 30 times the average distance between the Sun and Earth, and it takes almost 165 years for it to make one complete revolution around our star. On July 12, 2011, Neptune made its first full orbit since the planet was discovered in 1846. Seen from our planet, Neptune could thus be observed differently since the day of its discovery, because the period of revolution of the Earth around the Sun, which is 365 days, is not a multiple of the period of Neptune's revolution. The axial tilt of Neptune is 28.3 degrees which is similar to the axial tilt of the Earth and Mars. Therefore, the planet experiences similar seasonal changes. However, due to Neptune's long orbital period, 
the seasons last about 40 years each. Neptune's side reel rotation period is about 16 hours and 7 minutes. Due to an axial tilt similar to that of the Earth, changes in the side reel rotation period during its long year are not significant. As Neptune has no solid surface, its atmosphere is subject to differential rotation. Indeed, the large equatorial zone rotates with a period of about 18 hours, which is slower than the estimated rotation of about 16 hours of the planet's magnetic field. Unlike the equator, the polar regions rotate in 12 hours. Among all the planets of the solar system, this type of rotation is the most pronounced in Neptune. This leads to a strong latitudinal tilt of the wind. The change of seasons on Neptune as well as on Earth occurs as the planet moves along its orbit. Neptune's axis of rotation is deviated from the vertical position by 28 degrees, which is similar to the tilt of the axis of the Earth, which is 23.5 degrees. Simply here, the duration of each season is much longer, 41 years. When the southern hemisphere of Neptune is turned towards the Sun, the polar day lasts 41 years in the region of the South Pole, and in the southern hemisphere, all this time corresponds to summer, which began in 2005 and will last until 2046. During this period, polar night will reign around the North Pole of Neptune. With the arrival of summer in the southern hemisphere, the atmospheric processes on Neptune have also changed. Several large vortices have appeared which change their shape and even disappear completely. It should be noted that all these changes were observed with the help of the space telescope Hubble. In the regions of the planet far from the poles, the sun rises and sets at the usual frequency, corresponding to the time of rotation of Neptune around its axis. This rotation is faster than that of the Earth. A day lasts only 16 hours and 7 minutes. Thus, in a single year, Neptune manages to make 89,630 revolutions around its axis, or exactly as many days in a Neptune year. Thus, each of the seasons lasts about 22,400 Neptunian days. Neptune has a great influence on the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is a ring of icy minor planets, similar to the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, but much larger. It extends from the orbit of Neptune, that is to say 30 astronomical units, and stops at 55 astronomical units from the Sun. Because of its proximity, Neptune's gravitational pull has a significant effect on the Kuiper Belt, including the formation of its structure. During the existence of the solar system, some regions of the Kuiper Belt have been destabilized by Neptune's gravity, resulting in the formation of gaps in the structure of the belt. The orbits of objects that can be maintained in this belt for a sufficiently long time are determined by the so-called secular resonance with Neptune. For some orbits, this time is comparable to the time of the entire existence of the solar system. These resonances appear when the period of revolution of an object around the Sun is in correlation with the period of revolution of Neptune. In this way, the objects stabilize each other's orbits. If, for example, an object revolves around the Sun twice as slowly as Neptune, then it will travel exactly halfway, while Neptune will return to its initial position. The most densely populated part of the Kuiper Belt, with more than 200 known objects, is in a 2-3 to three resonance with Neptune. These objects make a revolution every one and a half revolutions of Neptune, and are known as Plutino, because one of the largest Kuiper Belt objects, Pluto, is one of them. 
Although the orbits of Neptune and Pluto are very close to each other, the two to three resonance will prevent them from colliding. At the level of the gravitational stability zones, Neptune harbors many Trojan asteroids as if it were dragging them into its orbit. Neptune's Trojans are in a one-to-one -one resonance with it. Trojans are very stable in their orbits. It is therefore likely that in the distant past they were captured by Neptune's gravitational field. Most likely, they were formed with it. The largest structure associated with Neptune is its magnetosphere, which extends from the planet to a gigantic distance, precisely up to 650,000 kilometers, or 400,000 miles, or 13 times the diameter of the planet itself. Neptune's magnetic field was first discovered in 1989, during a flyby of the planet by the space probe Voyager 2. It turned out that the magnetic axis of Neptune is deviated from the axis of rotation of the planet by 47 degrees, so during the rotation of Neptune, the magnetic axis changes its position in space by almost 90 degrees, so the shape of the magnetosphere changes dramatically in a few hours. It turns towards the flow of charged particles coming from the Sun by the solar wind either laterally, like the terrestrial magnetosphere, or upwards, like the magnetosphere of Uranus. A complete cycle remains 16 hours and 7 minutes. Consequently, the lines of force in the magnetic tail extending behind Neptune are then parallel to each other. Such a magnetosphere of very variable shape is unique among all planets. In addition, the magnetic axis is offset by 13,500 kilometers or 8,300 miles from the physical center of the planet. Such a strong offset is due to the remote location of the liquid hydrogen layer in which the movement of electrically charged particles generates a magnetic field. From time to time, a glow appears over Neptune called the aurora. It is explained by the interaction of the gases of the upper atmosphere with the high energy particles arriving with the solar wind. Because of the strong inclination of the magnetic axis, the aurora on Neptune are not located above its poles at all, but at a distance of 40 to 50 degrees from them, so they can no longer be called polar. If this were the case on Earth, then the auroras would be observed not in Siberia, Greenland, and Antarctica, but in southern Europe. Located 30 times farther from the Sun than the Earth, Neptune is not visible to the naked eye, which is why this ice giant has long remained unknown. Its discovery has allowed us to better understand how the planets of the solar system were formed. Neptune was not discovered until the 19th century. However, if you look closely at Galileo's sketches from 1612, you can see that the dots indicate the location of the ice giant. So at that time, the planet was simply mistaken for a star. In 1821, Alexis Bovard published sky maps showing the orbital path of Uranus. Subsequent observations showed significant deviations of the real motion of Uranus from the published one. In particular, the English astronomer Thomas John Hussey, based on his own observations, discovered anomalies in the orbit of Uranus and suggested that they could be caused by the presence of an external planet. In 1843, John Adams began a detailed study of the orbital passage of Uranus and calculated the orbit of a hypothetical eighth planet to explain the change in Uranus's orbit. He sent his calculations to Sir George Airy, Astronomer Royal, who in response asked for clarification. The French astronomer Urbain Le Verrier, independently of Adams, 
made his own calculations in the years 1845 and 1846, but the astronomers of the Paris Observatory did not share his enthusiasm and did not start to search for the alleged planet. In June 1846, after learning of the first estimate of the planet's longitude published by Leverrier, the director of the Cambridge Observatory, James Challis, embarked on a search for the planet, which continued unsuccessfully in August and September of the same year. Challis observed Neptune twice, but because he postponed the processing of the results of the observations to a later date, he was not able to identify the desired planet in the appropriate time. Meanwhile, Leverrier managed to convince the astronomer of the Berlin Observatory, Johann Gottfried Gall, to go in search of the planet. Gall compared a recently drawn map of the sky around Leverrier's predicted location with the observation of the sky at the moment in order to notice the movement of the planet in relation to fixed stars. Thus, the planet was discovered on the first night after about an hour of searching. Gal continued to observe the area of the sky, where the planet was located for two nights, thanks to which he was able to detect its movement relative to the stars and ensure that it was indeed a new planet. Neptune was discovered on September 23, 1846, within one degree of the coordinates predicted by Leverrier and about 12 degrees of the coordinates predicted by Adams. The discovery of the planet Neptune caused a lot of controversy concerning the discoverer, especially between the British and the French, each of them wanting to consider the discovery of Neptune as their own. But later, the scientific world recognized the merits of Leverrier and Adams. In fact, this planet was called Leverrier's planet for a while. Then Leverrier himself gave it the name Neptune, and this was approved by the scientific community. From the time of its discovery until 1930, Neptune was the farthest known planet in the solar system from the Sun. After the discovery of Pluto, Neptune became the penultimate planet. However, the study of the Kuiper Belt in 1992 led to a discussion on whether Pluto should be considered a planet or part of the Kuiper Belt. In 2006, the International Astronomical Union adopted a new definition of the term planet and classified Pluto as a dwarf planet, thus making Neptune the last planet in the solar system again. Exploration of the planet Neptune and its satellites has only been carried out by the Voyager 2 spacecraft. The exploration of Neptune is very difficult because of the great distances that separate the planet from the Earth and the Sun. Each mission must be equipped with a power system capable of providing energy to the probe without the possibility of converting solar energy by using photovoltaic panels. Scientists are also using the Hubble Space Telescope and powerful ground-based telescopes to gather more information about this distant planet. The Voyager 2 spacecraft was launched on August 20, 1977, at the initiative of NASA, intended in particular to study Neptune. Initially, its mission was to explore Saturn and Jupiter and their satellites. However, the flight trajectory was calculated to fly over Uranus and Neptune to study them. Thanks to a special gravitational maneuver, Voyager 2 was able to reduce the duration of its flight to Neptune by an average of 20 years. Neptune being the last large planet that can be visited by a spacecraft, it was decided to make a close flyby near Triton. The Voyager 2 spacecraft made its closest approach to Neptune on August 25, 1989. From its position, the probe was able to take the first pictures of this mysterious ice giant. The probe's signals to send these data back to Earth 
took over 245 minutes. The Voyager 2 spacecraft made a close pass by the moon Nerid before passing just 4,400 kilometers or 2,700 miles from Neptune's atmosphere on August 25, 1989. Later that day, Voyager 2 flew past Neptune's largest moon, Triton. All this happened in one day. To date, most of what we know about Neptune comes from Voyager 2. This spacecraft confirmed the existence of the planet's magnetic field and found that it is tilted like the field of Uranus. The question of the rotation period of the planet was solved by measuring the radio emission. Voyager 2 also showed the exceptionally active weather system of Neptune. Thanks to this mission, six new moons and rings were discovered. Later, the planet was observed by the Hubble Orbital Observatory. In 2002, the study of Neptune continued from Earth using a powerful telescope named Blanco, located in Chile. During this period, four more moons were discovered. A year later, scientists from the University of Hawaii discovered the 13th moon. The last and 14th moon was officially discovered by American astronomer Mark Robert Showalter in 2013, but later it turned out that this celestial body had already been captured several times by Hubble. In 2007, Voyager 2 entered the heliopause region. This is the boundary of the solar system beyond which interstellar space begins, in about 10 to 20 years, Voyager 2 will leave the solar system, passing the heliopause. Once in interstellar space, unable to transmit signals to Earth by radio, the spacecraft will lose contact with Earth forever. The probe is headed for the constellations of Sagittarius and Peacock. In about 40,000 years, Voyager 2 is scheduled to pass within 1.7 light-years of the star, Ross 248, in the constellation Andromeda. In 2016, NASA planned to send a new Neptune orbiter mission to Neptune in order to answer various questions about the nature of the planet, including its atmosphere, climate, ring system, as well as its moons, especially Triton. The sending of a new mission of exploration towards this planet, of a very high cost considering its distance, is not envisaged before 2030. At the present time, no estimated launch date has been announced, and the strategic plan for the exploration of the solar system does not include this planet anymore. Uranus is now the research priority, not Neptune. In comparative planetology, a science that compares the properties and geological structure of planets, Neptune, like its twin Uranus, occupies an intermediate position between the terrestrial planets and the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. The approximate age of the planet Neptune is 4.6 billion years. To explain the formation of the ice giants, Neptune and Uranus, it has been difficult to create an accurate model. Current models suggest that the density of matter in the outer regions of the solar system was too low for the formation of such large bodies by the traditionally accepted method of accretion of matter onto the core. Many hypotheses have been put forward to explain the formation and evolution of Uranus and Neptune. One of them proposes that the two ice giants did not form by accretion, but appeared due to instabilities within the primordial photoplanetary disk, and later their atmospheres were blown away by the radiation of a massive O or B class star. Indeed, the Sun was formed in a star nursery similar to the Orion Nebula. It is therefore very likely that our early solar system was formed very close to a nearby star system. 
During the formation of the solar system, the less volatile chemical elements remained in the vicinity of the Sun, a very hot area. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are the result. They are high-density planets. While the light or volatile chemical elements were transported to the outer region of the solar system, and giant gas planets are the result, Jupiter and Saturn. At the coldest periphery, the planets Uranus and Neptune were formed. Another hypothesis indicates that Uranus and Neptune formed closer to the Sun, where the density of matter was higher, and then moved to their current orbits. The Neptune shift hypothesis is popular because it would explain the current resonances in the Kuiper belt, in particular, the 2 to 5 resonance. As Neptune moved outward, it collided with objects in the proto Kuiper belt, creating new resonances and chaotically altering existing orbits. It is thought that the scattered disk objects ended up in their current positions due to interactions with resonances created by Neptune's migration. A computer model from 2004 suggested that Neptune's movement toward the Kuiper belt could be caused by a 1 to 2 resonance in the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn which acted as a kind of gravitational lever that forced Uranus and Neptune to change position and pushed them into higher orbits. The expulsion of Kuiper Belt objects by this migration may also explain the late bombardment, which occurred 600 million years after the formation of the solar system, and the appearance of Trojan asteroids around Jupiter. Little is known about the internal structure of Neptune, as it can only be judged on the basis of indirect data, since no atmospheric surveys of this planet have been conducted. Scientists believe that the internal structure of Neptune is similar to that of Uranus. The atmosphere represents about 5 to 10 percent of the total mass of the planet, and extends over 10 to 20 percent of the planet's radius. The pressure at the center reaches 7 megabars, about 7 million times higher than at the Earth's surface. Volumetric concentrations of methane, ammonia, and water have been found in the lower atmosphere. According to calculations, at the center of Neptune, there should be a core composed of iron, nickel, and silicates, with a mass 1.2 times that of the Earth. The temperature at the core could reach 7,800 degrees Celsius, or 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit, more than at the surface of our Sun. Gradually, this darker and hotter region condenses into a superheated liquid mantle, where temperatures are very high. The mass of Neptune's mantle exceeds that of the Earth by 10 to 15 times, this main part of Neptune consists of a layer of about 15,000 kilometers, or 10,000 miles thick, around this dense core. It consists mainly, according to various estimates, of water ice, ammonia, and methane, to which possibly stony materials are also mixed. According to scientists' calculations, the temperature in this layer should increase with depth from 2,500 degrees Celsius or 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit to 5,500 degrees Celsius or 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the ice does not evaporate because it is in the bowels of Neptune, where the pressure is several million times greater than atmospheric pressure on Earth. Such conditions press the molecules together, preventing them from flying away and evaporating. Probably, the substance is in an ionic state when atoms and molecules are crushed into separate charged particles, i.e., ions and electrons. According to the terminology generally accepted in planetology, this matter is said to be icy, although it is a hot and very dense liquid, highly conductive of electricity. 
Of course, it is difficult to imagine such an ice, which is why sometimes this layer of Neptune is called the Ionic Ocean. Although it is also very difficult to imagine it as an ordinary liquid. Next comes Neptune's third layer, or outer gas envelope, about 8,000 kilometers or 5,000 miles thick. This subatmosphere, consisting of hydrogen and helium, gradually penetrates the ice layer, without a well-defined boundary, as the density of matter increases under the pressure of the overlying layers. In the deep parts of this layer, gases are transformed into crystals. It is a kind of frost. There are more and more of these crystals in the deeper layers, and these begin to resemble snow slush soaked with water, and even deeper, they turn completely into ice under enormous pressure. The transition layer from gas to ice layer is quite large, about 3,000 kilometers or 1,800 miles. The thickness of the gas envelope around Neptune reaches several thousand kilometers. It contains 80% hydrogen, 19% helium, and 1% methane. Methane scatters blue rays well, which gives Neptune a color consistent with its name, marine blue, or blue, with a slight greenish tint. Note that hydrogen and helium are colorless gases. Notable methane absorption bands occur at wavelengths greater than 600 nanometers in the red and infrared portions of the spectrum. As with Uranus, the absorption of red light by methane is a key factor in giving Neptune's atmosphere a blue hue, although Neptune's bright blue is different from the more moderate blue-green glow of Uranus. Since the amount of methane in Neptune's atmosphere is not much different from that of Uranus, it is assumed that there is also a yet unknown component in the atmosphere that contributes to the formation of this characteristic color of Neptune. Neptune's atmosphere is divided into two main regions. The lower is the troposphere, where the temperature decreases with altitude, and the stratosphere, where the temperature increases with altitude. The boundary between these layers, called the tropopause, is at a pressure level of 0.1 bar. Higher up, the stratosphere gives way to the thermosphere at pressures below 10 to the minus 4 power microbars. Higher up, the thermosphere gradually passes into the exosphere. Models of Neptune's troposphere suggest that depending on height, it is composed of clouds of varying composition. The high clouds are located in the region of pressure below 1 bar where the temperature favors the condensation of methane. At pressures between 1 and 5 bars, clouds of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide are formed. At pressures above 5 bar, the clouds may consist of ammonia, ammonium sulfide, hydrogen sulfide, and water. Deeper, at a pressure of about 50 bar, water ice clouds may exist at a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Clouds of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide may be present in this area. Neptune's high-altitude clouds were observed by the shadows they cast on the opaque cloud layer. Among them stand out cloud bands that wrap around the planet at a constant latitude. These peripheral bands are 50 to 30 miles wide and 150 kilometers or 90 miles and are themselves at an altitude of about 100 kilometers or 60 miles above the main cloud layer. Study of Neptune's spectrum suggests that its lower stratosphere is cloudy due to the condensation of ultraviolet photolysis products of methane such as ethane and acetylene. Traces of hydrogen cyanide and carbon monoxide have also been found in the stratosphere. Neptune's stratosphere is warmer than that of Uranus. This is explained by the existence of higher concentrations of hydrocarbons. For unknown reasons, 
the thermosphere of the planet has an abnormally high temperature of about 500 degrees Celsius, or 930 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the planet is too far from the sun to warm the thermosphere with ultraviolet radiation. This phenomenon is perhaps a consequence of the atmospheric interaction with the ions of the planet's magnetic field. According to another theory, the basis of the heating mechanism is explained by the gravity waves of the internal regions of the planet, which are dispersed in the atmosphere. The thermosphere contains traces of carbon monoxide and water, which may come from external sources such as meteorites and dust. One of the differences between Neptune's atmosphere and that of Uranus is the level of meteorological activity. Voyager 2, flying near Uranus in 1986, recorded extremely low atmospheric activity. Unlike Uranus, Neptune has seen notable climate changes during a Voyager 2 mission in 1989. The dynamics of Neptune's atmosphere is very active even though the planet is located very far from the Sun. Indeed, it receives 900 times less energy per unit area than the Earth. The temperature at the outer surface of the clouds is very low, only minus 214 degrees Celsius or minus 353 degrees Fahrenheit. However, Neptune emits 2.7 times more energy into space than it receives from the Sun. This indicates that energy is being released into the interior of the planet. There is no clear explanation of the origin of such a process. It could be either a natural radioactive decay in the rocks of Neptune's stony core, or the release of gravitational energy if its interior is still compressed in the ongoing process of planet formation. In either case, the atmosphere is heated from within and is in constant motion. The climate on Neptune is characterized by an extremely dynamic storm system, with winds reaching extraordinary strengths, moving at speeds up to 2,000 kilometers per hour. This is almost a supersonic flow in the atmosphere of the planet where the wind speed exceeds that of sound on Earth. The general pattern of the winds shows that at high latitudes their direction coincides with the direction of the planet's rotation, and at low latitudes it is opposite. Most of the winds on Neptune blow in the opposite direction to the rotation of the planet on its axis. In fact, the winds blow from west to east carrying air in a direction parallel to the equator. Near the poles, their speed is much greater than near the equator. Surprisingly, the planet with the coldest outer atmosphere in the solar system has the highest wind speeds. Such winds came as a great surprise to scientists, who would assume before the Voyager 2 flight that Neptune's cold atmosphere was a sleeping kingdom. Instead, these winds revealed a raging world of hurricanes. The content of methane, ethane, and acetylene in the equatorial region of the atmosphere exceeds the content of these substances in the polar region of the atmosphere by tens and hundreds of times. This observation can be considered as evidence in favor of the existence of the upwelling phenomenon at the equator of Neptune and its lowering near the poles. In 2006, it was observed that the upper troposphere of Neptune's south pole was 10 degrees Celsius warmer, or 18 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, than the rest of Neptune, which averages minus 200 degrees Celsius or minus 328 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature difference is enough to cause methane, which is frozen in other regions of Neptune's upper atmosphere, to seep into space at the South Pole. This hot spot is a consequence of Neptune's axial tilt, 
with the South Pole facing the Sun for a quarter of a Neptunian year, or about 40 Earth years. As Neptune slowly orbits towards the opposite side of the Sun, the South Pole will gradually enter the shadow, and Neptune will expose the North Pole to the Sun. Thus, the release of methane into space will move from the South Pole to the North. Due to seasonal changes, cloud bands in the southern hemisphere of Neptune have undergone an increase in size and albedo. This trend was noticed as early as 1980 and was seen in 2020 with the start of the new season on Neptune. It is worth remembering that the seasons change every 40 years it is thought that the more varied climate on Neptune compared to Uranus is a consequence of a higher internal temperature, even though Neptune is one and a half times farther from the Sun than Uranus, and receives only 40% of the amount of sunlight received by Uranus. The surface temperatures of these two planets are about equal. The upper troposphere of Neptune reaches a very low temperature of minus 221 degrees Celsius, or minus 365 degrees Fahrenheit. At a depth where the pressure is one bar, the temperature reaches minus 201 degrees Celsius, or minus 329 degrees Fahrenheit. The gases go deeper, but the temperature increases steadily. As for Uranus, the heating mechanism is unknown, but the difference is important. Uranus radiates 1.1 times more energy than it receives from the Sun. Neptune radiates 2.7 times more than it receives energy. Several possible explanations have been proposed, including radiogenic heating by the core of the planet, similar to the heating of the Earth by radioactive potassium-40, disassociation of methane into other chain hydrocarbons under the condition of Neptune's atmosphere, and convection in the lower atmosphere, which causes gravitational waves to decelerate above the tropopause. The largest atmospheric vortices on Neptune reach several thousand kilometers in diameter. Against the general light blue background of the planet, these formations look like very dark and dense blue ovals, for which they have been given the name Dark Spots. They appear in the atmosphere for some time, sometimes several months or even years, then dissolve and disappear gradually. The largest hurricane observed so far, called the Great Dark Spot, was located in the southern hemisphere of Neptune in 1989, when the Voyager 2 station flew over the planet. The diameter of this vortex exceeded the diameter of our Earth. The photographs clearly show the details of the structure of a huge hurricane, the dark central part, and the clear ring of clouds surrounding it, constantly moving in a circle at a gigantic speed. It was a huge vortex in the center of which one could see the deepest and darkest layers of Neptune's atmosphere. In addition, this vortex was accompanied by a luminous cloud called Scooter. Recent computer simulations have shown that scooters are methane clouds, which are often found near dark spots. The Great Dark Spot was one of Voyager 2's first discoveries in the Southern Hemisphere. Neptune's winds carried the Great Dark Spot westward at more than 300 meters per second or more than 1,000 feet per second. Five years later, in 1994, images taken from Earth orbit by the Hubble Space Telescope no longer revealed the Great Dark Spot. This hurricane had either subsided or been covered by a continuous cloud cover. All dark spots in Neptune's atmosphere are characterized by a bright white border on the polar side. This is most likely methane frost on the coldest parts of the clouds, a few months later, the Space Telescope discovered a new dark patch in Neptune's northern hemisphere. This indicates that Neptune's atmosphere is changing very rapidly.
Neptune's dark spots are thought to originate in the troposphere at lower altitudes than the brighter, more visible clouds. Thus, these spots appear to be holes in the upper cloud layer, as they open up spaces that allow us to see through the darker, deeper layers of clouds. Because these storms are persistent and can last for several months, they are thought to have a vortex structure. Often associated with the dark patches, brighter, persistent methane clouds form in the tropopause. The persistence of the accompanying clouds indicates that some of the former dark spots may continue to exist as cyclones, even as they lose their dark color. The dark spots may dissipate if they get too close to the equator or by some other yet unknown mechanism. Neptune, the most distant planet in the solar system, has 14 known moons. Nearly half of them were discovered fairly recently, after Voyager 2 flew near the ice giant. All the moons of the planet except one have names that are associated with Greek and Roman mythologies, with the gods Neptune and Poseidon. They are divided into two classes, regular and irregular moons, the first are represented by Naiad, Thalassa, Despina, Galatia, Larissa, Hippocampus, and Proteus. These moons are the closest to the planet. They move on circular orbits. The moons of this class are distant from the planet from 48,000 kilometers, or 30,000 miles, to 117,000 kilometers, or 117,000 miles, and all of them except Hippocampus and Proteus, go around the planet in less time than its orbital period. Irregular moons, on the other hand, follow eccentric or retrograde-inclined orbits and are located at a great distance from the planet. The exception is Triton, which orbits Neptune in a circular orbital path. In the list of this class of irregular moons, we can find Triton, Nereid, Halimedes, Sao, Laomedia, Nesso, and Samathia. From 28 kilometers or 17 miles in diameter for Samathia to 60 kilometers or 37 miles for Halimede, Triton and Nereid are considered separately because they are the largest irregular moons around Neptune. Triton holds 99.5% of the orbital mass of Neptune. All the moons, with the exception of Proteus and Larissa, have an elongated shape. They orbit close to the planet and have unusual eccentricities. Triton completes an almost perfect circle, while Nereid has the most eccentric orbit. The largest moon of Neptune is Triton. It is the seventh by increasing distance from this planet, and above all, the most imposing of Neptune's moons which presents many scientific questions about its origin, its composition, and the surprise it has recently revealed. Here are the interesting facts about Triton and its largest moons. Triton, Neptune's largest moon, was discovered by English astronomer William Lassell in 1846, precisely 17 days after the discovery of Neptune itself and was named after a sea god, Triton, the son of Poseidon in Greek mythology. Triton is one of the coldest bodies in the solar system. Triton orbits Neptune in the opposite direction, in an orbit inclined 23 degrees to the equatorial plane of the planet. The unusual orbit suggests that Triton did not form with Neptune, but was captured by it from the Kuiper belt. It orbits at a distance of 355,000 kilometers, or 220,000 miles, from Neptune. An attempt to measure the diameter of the satellite was made by Gerard Kuiper in 1954. Initially, the diameter was estimated at 3,800 kilometers, or 2,300 miles. Through telescope observations, it turned out to be 2,706 kilometers, or 1,600 miles, 
i.e. three-quarters of the diameter of our moon, the mass of Triton is 99.5% of the total mass of all the currently known moons of Neptune. Thus, all other moons have a very small mass. It is the only large moon in the solar system that moves in an opposite direction to its planet. Another feature of Triton's orbit is that it is an almost regular circle. The characteristics of Triton's structure and orbital motion suggest that it originated in the Kuiper Belt as a separate celestial body, similar to Pluto, and was then captured by Neptune. Calculations show that the usual gravitational capture was unlikely. According to one hypothesis, Triton was part of a binary system and in this case, the probability of capture increases. According to another version, Triton slowed down and was captured because it approached the upper layers of the atmosphere of Neptune. The influence of the tides gradually brought it into an orbit close to a circle, while energy was released and melted the depths of this moon. The surface froze faster than the interior, and then, as the water ice in the interior froze and expanded, the surface became covered with cracks. It is possible that the capture of Triton disrupted the lunar system that Neptune already possessed, and the unusual orbit of Nereid, Neptune's third largest moon, is a reminder of this process. According to one hypothesis, the interaction of Neptune's and Triton's tides heats up the planet, and this would be why Neptune releases more heat than Uranus. As a consequence, Triton is progressively approaching Neptune, and one day they will collide. Thus, in several million years, the residues of the collision will form rings around Neptune, even more imposing than the rings of Saturn. On Triton, nitrogen ice covers about 55% of the surface, 20 to 35% is water ice, and 10 to 25% is dry ice. Triton's surface, mainly in the south polar cap, is covered with small amounts of frozen methane and carbon monoxide at 0.1% and 0.05% respectively. Around the satellite, there is a very rarefied atmosphere, about 10 kilometers or 6 miles thick which consists of nitrogen with a small amount of methane. As some studies have shown, warming of Triton's southern hemisphere leads to a thin surface layer of frozen nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide sublimating into a gaseous state, which increases the thickness and density of the atmosphere. An increase in atmospheric temperature on Triton of 5% has also been discovered. This is associated with the beginning of the summer period, because with an increase in temperature, the amount of gas evaporating from the surface increases. Extensive clouds have also been recorded on Triton. Instead of the expected seas and lakes of liquid nitrogen, an ice kingdom has been discovered on Triton. A large area around its south pole is covered with ice and frost, which reflects 70 to 95% of the light falling on its surface. In fact, since nitrogen freezes at minus 210 degrees Celsius, or minus 346 degrees Fahrenheit, and the temperature on this moon is extremely low, about minus 235 degrees Celsius, or minus 391 degrees Fahrenheit, the nitrogen is in the form of frost. However, Triton is not just a block of ice. The average density of this moon is 2 grams per cubic centimeter, which is slightly higher than the density of Saturn's icy moons. During the flyby of the Voyager 2 spacecraft near Triton, the latter had some gravitational effect on the spacecraft, thanks to which the presence of a core in Triton was determined. As a result, it is believed to consist of a rocky core 950 kilometers or 590 miles in diameter, surrounded by a layer of water ice 350 kilometers 
or 217 miles thick. Landforms of various shapes have been discovered on Triton, indicating its geological activity in the past and testifying to a very bizarre cryogenic, low-temperature volcanism, where the role of molten magma is played by a cold liquid that rises from the depths and freezes to the surface, forming strange ice landforms. The main surprise of Triton is its modern geological activity, which nobody expected before the Voyager 2 flight. Photographs revealed gas geysers, dark columns of nitrogen, operating vertically up to a height of 8 kilometers, where they begin to spread parallel to Triton's surface, and stretch in tails up to 150 kilometers or 90 miles. Ten active geysers were discovered. All were smoking in the south polar region over which the sun was at its zenith during this period. The reason for the activity of the gas geysers is considered to be heating by the sun, causing the melting of nitrogen ice at a certain depth, where water ice and methane compounds are also found. The pressure of the gas mixture that occurs in the deep layer, when heated by only 4 degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit, although low, is quite sufficient to throw the gas into Triton's rarefied atmosphere. Triton, Jupiter's moon Io, and the planet Venus are the only bodies in the solar system other than Earth known to be volcanically active at this time. It is also interesting to note that the volcanic processes occurring in the outer solar system are different. The eruptions on Earth and Venus, and on Mars in the past, are composed of rocky material and are driven by the planet's internal heat. Flares on Io are composed of sulfur or sulfur compounds and are driven by tidal interactions with Jupiter. The eruptions of Triton are composed of volatile compounds such as nitrogen or methane and are driven by the seasonal heating of the Sun. Other moons around Saturn and Jupiter could also complete this list, like Enceladus and Europa. Proteus is the second largest and largest inner moon of Neptune. Despite its large size, it was discovered later in 1989. This is due to its location very close to the planet, which made it difficult to detect. Proteus has an irregular shape, it is most likely a fragment of one of Neptune's pre-existing moons, destroyed in a collision with Neptune. The surface of Proteus is covered with numerous craters, but no geological activity has been detected on its surface. Scientists do not exclude the possibility that with time, the moon under the influence of its own gravity takes a spherical shape. With a diameter of 340 kilometers or 200 miles, Nereid is the third largest moon of Neptune, discovered more than 100 years after the planet itself. It orbits the planet in a highly elongated orbit, now approaching the central point of the local planetary system by 1.4 million kilometers or 800,000 miles then moving away from it by 9.6 million kilometers or 6 million miles. Such a high orbital eccentricity suggests that this moon may be an asteroid or former dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt, pulled toward Neptune by its gravity. It has no atmosphere, and the surface temperature is about minus 220 degrees Celsius, or minus 364 degrees Fahrenheit. Until now, Nereid is the least explored moon of the solar system. This Neptunian moon was discovered in 1981 by a team of astronomers from Earth, and in 1989, this discovery was confirmed by the Voyager 2 probe. Larissa has a non-spherical shape. Its surface is strongly cratered. No trace of geological activity has been found on this moon. Presumably, Larissa was formed from the debris of Neptune's former moons, 
which had time to collapse before Triton appeared in its system. Today, the moon rotates at a distance of 73,500 kilometers, or 45,000 miles from the planet. But this distance is gradually decreasing under the influence of central tidal forces. In time, Larissa will be destroyed in a collision with Neptune. The presence of Neptune's rings was first announced by British astronomer William Lassell, who made observations in October 1846, a few days after the discovery of the planet. He observed the ring several times and only six years later came to the conclusion that it was an optical illusion. The first real evidence that Neptune is surrounded by rings appeared almost a century and a half later. After the unexpected discovery of rings around Uranus in 1977, Astronomers wondered if Jupiter and Neptune had rings. In 1982, Edward Gwynnon of Villanova University in Pennsylvania reviewed his own 1968 observations and thought he had photographed two faint rings, but the evidence proved inconclusive. In 1984, French astrophysicist André Brayac made observations of Neptune at the Cerro Tololo Observatory in Chile. It was found that when Neptune passed over the background of a distant star, its light was interrupted three times by certain objects located at the same distance from Neptune. These objects were called arcs, and they began to be considered as sections of the unformed ring. The substance they contain is unevenly distributed. In fact, the density drops sharply at the ends of the arc. It is very difficult to imagine a stable accumulation of particles in one part of the orbit. After all, the periods of revolution of the independent particles are at least slightly different, so that the whole cluster should gradually stretch along the orbit and turn into a ring. Five years later, in 1989, photographs taken from the Voyager 2 station did reveal rings surrounding the planet. There were six of them, and all are very dark, reflecting less than 3% of the light falling on them. But when viewed from the unlit side, the rings appear much brighter. This paradox, which was revealed in Voyager 2 photographs, is explained by the fact that the rings are made of very small dark particles, dust particles, which reflect light poorly, but because of their small size, they scatter it well forward. The names of the rings glorify the names of scientists and astronomers, and in the first place, those who were directly involved in the discovery of the eighth planet of the solar system, Galley, Leverrier, Lassell, Arago, and Adams, with an unnamed ring that coincides with the orbit of the Neptunian moon Galatia. The German astronomy Johann Gall was the first to examine the planet through a magnifying instrument. The ring that bears his name comes first and is at a distance of about 43,000 kilometers or 26,000 miles from Neptune. The Leveria ring is only 113 kilometers or 70 miles wide. At a distance of 53,000 kilometers or 32,000 miles, with a width of 4,000 kilometers or 2,500 miles, is the Lasalle ring. This is the widest ring. The Arago ring is 100 kilometers or 60 miles wide, located 57,200 kilometers or 35,000 miles from Neptune. The Adams ring is only 35 kilometers or 21 miles wide. But this ring is the brightest on Neptune and easy to find. It has five arcs, three of which are called Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. It is thought that the arcs were gravitationally captured by the moon Galatia, located inside the ring. It is now known that the ring system of Neptune consists of six components. 
The rings are composed of ice particles covered with silicates, or a carbon-based material, most likely giving them their reddish hue. Like the rings of Saturn and Jupiter, they are the broken remains of old moons. Generally speaking, in the rings the pieces of material are usually evenly distributed, but not on Neptune, at least not in its outermost ring. So instead of being nice regular rings, Neptunes are really bright in crescent-like segments in the rings. The bright arcs in Neptune's outer ring are the result of gravitational clumping, most likely of ice rather than rock, because ice is lighter and more likely to be affected by gravity. The ice also reflects more of the sun's rays from the top of Neptune's atmosphere, so the arcs shine brighter for us. The question is why the bright arcs are located where they are. It is known that particles in planetary ring systems move at a definite speed, and that the presence of nearby moons keeps the rings in place. In the case of Saturn, for example, the rings are protected by numerous moons. One of Neptune's moons, named Galatia, lies just inside the outermost ring. Galatia orbits the planet more slowly than the rings. It was thought that this speed difference was the reason for the discrete bright arcs. While the ring particles orbit the planet twice, the moon Galatia orbits the planet once. Astronomers thought that this resonance point was the cause of the uneven appearance of the ring. Now, more accurate readings have shown that it is not a single resonance point but a more complicated relationship with Galatia that is the cause. Scientists have calculated that the Moon has an eccentric orbit. In fact, the interaction of the gravitational clusters with the Moon changes the axis of the Moon's orbit, which is an elliptical orbit around Neptune. Measuring the changes in the Moon's orbit means that astronomers will now be able to estimate the amount of material contained in this cluster. But explaining how Galatia acquired its eccentric orbit in the first place poses a much greater challenge. The discovery of Neptune was extremely important because it expanded our understanding of the solar system and showed that it does not end behind Neptune. Another asteroid belt follows, the Kuiper Belt. Neptune, that distant azure blue planet orbiting at the edge of our solar system, is still full of mysteries and secrets, of which we still know almost nothing.